and the infilling of your spirit. I'm praying, Lord, that you'll bless this opening of the word. Please open our hearts. Heal us, Lord, from the ignorance that has allowed us to walk in the paths of those who are not enlightened. And I pray may this sermon do its work to put our feet on the path of leadership for the sake of salvation. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. I titled my message this morning, The Prophet in the Playground, Lessons from the Seesaw. Now, I, uh, my first kind of education was in physics. Physics. And uh, I learned it on the playground. And there were different places I learned it. These were the old school teeter-totters. You can see these were put together by poor people. These look nothing like the modern playgrounds that people look at. This is a two by 10 or a two by 12 with some galvanized steel put on it, laid over some galvanized pipes. And uh, fortunately, there's a base of wood chips there because teeter-totters have some inherent dangers, which is why you don't see them in a lot of uh, playgrounds anymore. Now, this is an upgrade because it's got mats underneath it and used tires of some little tractor, and uh, that's supposed to soften the blow. And of course, I don't know if we could really even call this a teeter-totter because there's no danger involved in this, except if you were a third person playing around the springs while somebody was uh, teetering and tottering. You know, there's something about teeter-totters we all learned very rapidly, and that is they were an early form of uh, weight comparison. And um, if the person on the one side got off the teeter-totter without telling you, you found a rapid uh, connection with the ground. It could be done maliciously. It could be done without intent. But nonetheless, there were a lot of physics being taught there. And of course, swinging was similar too, because depending on when you left the swing, you either rocketed across the grass, staining up your clothes, you either went straight up and landed straight down, or you had this nice sense of weightlessness for just a little while as you went far out. And of course, then there's the merry-go-round, which is also gone from most. And uh, you learn in the merry-go-round dynamics related to centrifugal force. Of course, if everybody leaned in on the merry-go-round, it'd go faster. When everybody leaned out on the merry-go-round, it'd slow down. You know, kind of like those ice skaters when they pull their arms in. These are all lessons from physics. And they were things that uh, I learned before I ever read a book. I learned about the laws of physics. Well, there were a couple people in uh, California recently reported on from uh, San Francisco, I believe it was, on uh, Channel 7. They set a record for the longest experience teeter-tottering. And uh, they went for 216 hours. So some of you went on a mission trip recently. Imagine if your mission trip was down to the playground and for the next 10 days, almost, you sat on a teeter-totter. That's what they did. That is slightly adapted, you can see here. And uh, there was quite a good audience. They said that during the day, that is Chuck and Mike said during the day it was easy because there were people cheering them on. But at night, it got a little bit tedious on the teeter-totter. Now the previous record was set over 50 years ago in 1971, and I've come to a conclusion that if you live in California, you have a lot of time on your hands <laughs> because both of these records were set by West Coasters. Had to give a little kiss there before it was all done, and at the end, they wondered about the value, and maybe so do we. This morning, I want to talk to you about balance. Balance. We're living in a very unique age, and it appears to me, since I've got a little longer look than some of you, a little bit shorter than others, it appears to me that we have a very unique thing happening in our society and our church. We have a society where people will walk into buildings with guns, usually young men. I've not heard of one young woman doing it unless you count the transgender version of that in Nashville. But usually young men, they'll go into buildings, malls, post offices, schools, and they will randomly take people's lives. 
And then we have the whole phenomena of laziness and lack of responsibility. I had a professor from the university tell me not too long ago that they were landing in Las Vegas and after they got their rental car and took off on the side of a big building was a billboard that said, we will hire you if you will show up for work. Um, you cannot build a strong society on these premises. And then we have the whole slew of addictions that are all around us. And I'm here to posture you this morning that we have a serious problem on our hands and our problem is a lack of balance. We have so emphasized the intellectual development, the digital, the superficial, the mental, that the other sides of people's lives are so out of whack that they don't know how to conduct themselves in public spheres. And I've said nothing yet, but I'll say it now in regards to social abilities today. Because people would much rather stare at their device than actually read the body language and have the verbiage that would engage a conversation with somebody else. And so all around us, we have the signs, the indices of tremendous mismanagement of imbalance. This was a very interesting thing for me. 542 times, uh, for some reason in the database that records the writings of Ellen White, there are these three words used together, physical, mental, and spiritual. And not long ago, I was looking at a book that was in a stack of books I have. I have lots of books that I never get time to read, but sometimes I'll just pick them up. And I picked up a book by a man named Ellsworth Olson on the origin and rise of, origin and progress of Seventh-day Adventists. And I thought, well, I'm going to see what he says about education, because I'm in a series on education. And on page 331, uh, there is about 13 pages dealing with three of our first schools. Now, we tend to think of uh, Goodloe Harper Bell as the founder of Christian education, and in many respects he was because what he started never stopped. But there were two others that preceded him. One is John F. Byington. One was a lady by Louise M. Morton. Louise M. Morton started the first elementary school. She got 25 cents a week per pupil to do it, but it, it didn't stick. There were some challenges with it. And John F. Byington, who would go on to be one of our general conference presidents, he also started a school. It was a bit more successful, but it's not until we get to Goodloe Harper Bell and Sidney Brownsburger in 1874 that we see it really kind of take off and go. But I thought, this book has 700 pages in it on the origin and progress of Seventh-day Adventism. What does it say about education? So right in the middle of the book, there's 13 pages. And I, I was kind of astounded. Uh, the author, Elder Olson, looks at Battle Creek College, Healdsburg College, which would become PUC. Of course, Battle Creek would become Andrews. And then also South Lancaster Academy, which would become Atlantic Union College. And it was very interesting to me. You have some pictures, you have some history, you have almost nothing about the academics. Almost nothing. But you do have a few pages in which there are multiple references to the dynamics of symmetry of character and the usefulness of manual training. So this morning, I'm here to suggest to you, not inductively where you've got to figure it out, but very deductively where I tell you, and I tell you again, and I tell you again, our society, including some of our homes, some of the minds of our children, some of our very own lives, some of our schools are completely out of balance, and it is a focus on the cerebral and an absence of the development of the rest of the physical and the spiritual. And it's creating a problem in society. We thought that information was the success formula, but it's turned out that it's more than information that's needed. It's a formative experience in which the character and the physical body as well needs some strengthening. Ellen White will say this in Acts of the Apostles, among the Jews, physical toil was not thought strange or degrading. Through Moses, the Hebrews have been instructed to train their children to industrious habits. Are we doing that, parents? I know you're so busy. It's easier to just put the dishes in the dishwasher and hit that robot vacuum cleaner and let things go. But you know what? Training somebody to be industrious is an industrial effort and difficult. And it was regarded as a sin. I don't want that phrase to get away from us. It was regarded as a sin to allow the youth to grow up lazy ignorant of physical labor. 
Even though a child was to be educated for a holy office, think pastor or priest, a knowledge of the practical life was thought essential. It's not added on. It's not peripheral. It's central. In other words, the understanding of education in the Hebrew worldview, not the Greek worldview, which is kind of dualistic, you know, body's bad, spirit's good, mind gets in there with the good part. No, in the Hebrew economy of thinking and in the writings of spirit of prophecy, the idea of relating to a child without a balanced, well-symmetrical character was anathema. Every youth, whether his parents were rich or poor, was taught some trade. Those parents who neglected to provide such a training for their children were looked upon as departing from the instruction of the Lord. In accordance with this custom, Paul had early learned the trade of tent making. Now, mind you, Paul will move the gospel forward with this because he knows that there's a bunch of suspicious people out there who are looking for who are on the lookout for scammers. And so he realizes in a large part of his ministry, he's got to pay his own way. Otherwise, they'll think this religion thing he's proffering is about money. And he won't do that. So Paul actually has a very resolute work ethic and a very strong personhood. And he moves the gospel forward on the basis of his ability to work with his hands. And of course, we've said nothing about the character of Paul here, which was shaped by the doing and the training, not just the thinking. The habits and principles of a teacher should be considered of even greater importance than his or her literary qualifications. Now, I want everybody to stop and think about this. Being smart is helpful, but being smart without being wise might be hurtful. It's important for us to understand that we are doing formative education, not just informative education. We are training the whole person. We are developing the character. We are teaching them how to be faithful in their marriages, in their church commitments, in their occupation. We are not just trying to make them smart with a little tincture of Christian worldview. No, we are trying to shape the whole person. And we need teachers who understand this and have a whole person vita or resume. If he's a sincere Christian, he'll feel the necessity of having an equal interest in physical, mental, moral, and spiritual education. Now, I think we could combine moral and spiritual probably into one, this three-legged stool of development. But I'm convinced most of us have drunk the Kool-Aid that the only thing that matters is to get smart as fast as you can so you can make as much money as you can and be on top of the dog pile or be the first in the race that goes with the rats. You know, we call that the rat race. But as Irma Bombeck said, it doesn't matter if you win the rat race, you're still a rat. And everybody needs to remember this. We're not called to be mono-focused. We're called to this symmetry of person. Battle Creek College was one of our very first institutions. Couple different views here. In relating to Battle Creek College, we have also a sister institution, which is where the first president of Battle Creek College went. He went to Healdsburg, PUC it is now. And uh, then off to Atlantic Union College, we'll go. This is where, it's kind of interesting. You had Sidney Brownsberger, who was the first president of Battle Creek College. He went west, and Goodloe Harper Bell, after some difficult years, went east. They both helped to establish other schools in our system. When I looked at Olson's book on the origin and progress of Adventism, on, on one page I counted at least 11, maybe 12 references to this dynamic of symmetrical or manual training or agrarian dynamics. Ellen White said, God designs that the college at Battle Creek shall reach a higher standard of intellectual and moral culture than any other institution of the kind in our land. I don't doubt for a second this still isn't God's plan for our colleges. We have more now than when she wrote this. We now have several in different unions, but there's still no doubt that our college is to be known not only for its intellectual attainments, but for its moral citizenry, the students that comprise our collegiate body. Better, higher, more noble, more dignified than any group in the United States. The youth should be taught the importance of cultivating their physical, mental, 
and moral powers. Now, I'm going to pause right there. There is a line of thinking going on on our college's campuses today that wounds us in two ways. That line of thinking is that our kids should go to school and they shouldn't have to work. They should go have the college experience. It's kind of the new mantra of what, what the university has to offer. I'm here to tell you, friends, it has a problem in a couple different ways. Number one, it doesn't create a balanced system where people are actually out working. When I went to school, and most of the people listening to me here today went to school, uh, number one, I was poor. I got asked to leave the school because I couldn't pay my bill. Number two, because of that, God kept me there. Praise the Lord. It's where he wanted me. And by the way, friends, God's will done God's way will never lack for God's supply. And so if he wants your young people being discipled in a Christian school, he has more than ample provision for them to be there through sacrifice, through the support of the church, and through the child working. There's something about working that's important. Our kids go to school, and without working, they forget that there's somebody else working very hard for this to happen. It's very expensive, and they need to be a part of it. It saddles them also with debt. There's a lot of debt on our students when they come out of school, and there doesn't need to be as much. As a matter of fact, some of our students come out with so much debt that they think they can't go into the ministry and they can't go into the teaching ministry because of all the money they owe. The truth of the matter is, is that we need to be teaching our kids to be industrious. Now, they may not all be working in the ways we worked 20 or 30, 40 years ago, but they should all be taught I believe they should be taught entrepreneurial skills as well to where they can actually be running businesses and doing the kinds of things that would create a little bit of balance. But our young people need the training of the physical, the mental is out there, and the moral, which is a great loss. Writing in his book, Olson says, meanwhile, the members of the board and the faculty, while grateful for what had been accomplished, regretted that the students were so largely subject to the outside influences except while attending lectures and recitations. Now, I've stuck this in because in a previous sermon I told you that Ellen White believed that they should have purchased 160 acres outside of Battle Creek. When they chose not to do that, she thought you should purchase the 50 acres of the old Battle Creek Fairgrounds. When they chose not to do that, she wept. They purchased 12 acres right as it were in the uh, conglomeration of of other buildings, the sanitarium, the, the press, etc., she wept. The only time that Olson will recognize that they were exempted from the influences of the world around them was when they were actually sitting in this building receiving their recitations. Now, it's worth today, friends. We could place our kids a long ways from the big cities, but they could have the mentalities of the world in their pocket. And I'm highly cautioning you in this morning sermon where I'm talking to you about balance. If you'd like to take a world, a world that's on informational steroids and imbalance your children further, just get them to where they keep their nose attached to a silver screen like this, carried around in their pocket, respond to every buzz, hum, and ding, and are constantly de determining their self-worth based on how many thumbs up or affirmations or likes or followers they have. It's a perfect formula to destroy the heart and soul of a child and maybe an adult. And everything I'm saying here today isn't just for those in their formative years. Physical, mental, and spiritual. In other words, there was a sense that we needed to have our kids away from those influences. That sense should still be prominent in our societies. They desired also to carry out more fully the instruction given through Mrs. White to the effect that useful labor with the hands should be combined with book study in such a way to give a symmetrical all-around training. The question that is at hand is this. Was the training primarily to make them able to go out and make a living? Or was the training to balance out the mental work that was going on? How many of you have ever had your computer on your lap and you felt the bottom of it and you said, oh, this is hot? How many have ever bought a cooling pad for your laptop computer? It's working hard. Well, I want you to know something. The synapses that are firing, the delicate dynamics of the brain, they're working on the same kind of need for rest and relaxation. How many of you have ever driven down the, the interstate and you felt your car steering wheel going like this? 
Your tires are either old and worn out or one of those little pieces of lead they used to balance your tire with and fall out. We call it out of balance. Some of you have been on our boundary water canoe trips, which are designed specifically to do a little bit of this symmetrical training. How many of you sat your stuff in the canoe and got in after the person in the front only to sense that the canoe is tipping like this? You have one or two choices. You can either slide all the way over to this side to balance it out, or you can stop and say, wait a second, we need to rearrange the load. I'm here to suggest to you this morning on the basis of inspiration, not theory or data, that with our children's lives not properly balanced, they're gonna turn out as aberrations of what the divine image should look like, not good reflections. And taking charge, now we're talking about AUC, talking about Healdsburg, what would become PUC, talking about Sidney Brownsburger. He left Battle Creek, he went to Pacific Union College, which wasn't called that yet. Here's the commentary. In taking charge of this second educational institution of the denomination, Professor Brownsberger was able to draw on his previous experience at Battle Creek. Especially did he desire to carry more fully the instruction that had been given concerning the combining of the physical with the mental. Our young people have to have balance. When I first came to Andrews University, I worked in the James White Library, so thankful for my church school teachers who knew Rebecca Twomley and Doris Helm, and they made an arrangement for me to get a job. There was only one problem with that job, superior managers and overseers, wonderful opportunity to engage with everybody, but I sat behind a desk all day long, looking back then, not so much at computer screens, but stacks and stacks of cards, yes, I'm that old, and uh, Eventually, after about two quarters of this, because we were on the quarter system, I said, I can't work here anymore. And regretful to the wonderful relationships I had with those dear supervising uh, ladies at the library there, I went and hired myself out for a 3.30 in the morning appointment at the dairy. And I want to tell you, rearranging my life to where I had enough sleep to be up at 3.30 in the morning to go down to the dairy was something else. But I never went back to the kind of mental work. I went from there on to the grounds department and it was a wonderful blessing to me to have the balanced approach of the physical and the mental. I want you to see the word especially. When Olson records his 13 pages in the Origin and Progress of Seventh-day Adventism, he goes overboard to point out the need for the manual, the industrial, the agricultural, the symmetrical, the dynamics that will produce a whole person, not just an aberration built on information. In the early period of Healdsburg College, gardening, horticulture, carpentry, printing, and tent making were among the industries carried on. And while this part of the school work was at times lacking supervision of the highly skilled instructors, it was taken up with enthusiasm by the pupils and, in, and entire into their building of symmetrical character. Now listen, that's a euphemism. What's he really saying is, the whole manual training part wasn't very well overseen and wasn't very organized, but the kids sure got into it. That was a nice way when he wrote his book many, many years ago as saying it wasn't run very well, but it was still invested in. She enlarged upon the importance of symmetrical education. The physical power should be taxed. He's talking about a talk Ellen White had, as well as the mental. Parents should not be allowed to have their children excused from physical labor. Now this is important. What's going on is she is affirming the fact that without this balance, we will not produce the product that we are supposed to be producing. Manual labor at the beginning, talking about Atlantic Union College, had to be carried on by a means of ax and saw. A huge supply of cordwood was piled up in the adjoining lot. Was this the most efficient way for them to get their work done? Probably not. And probably as we look at the difficulty of having industry and physically taxing, balancing experiences for our kids, we're going to have to recognize that they are as important a part of education as is the intellectual academic side and not expect them to only exist if they can pay for themselves. This is a huge problem in our schools. If we have an industry, it's only good as long as it helps meet the bottom line. And once it doesn't meet the bottom line, it's gone. And this is not the idea of Adventist education from the very beginning. Now I'm going to take you to a man who you could think was an Adventist educational philosopher. And I want to share just a little bit of what he has to say, desiring the kingdom. Talking now about two very different forms of education. If we consider these two very different understandings of education, the informative and the formative. 
Seventh-day Adventists believe in formative education, which includes some information, by the way, plenty of it when the mind's ready to receive it. If we consider these two very different understandings of education, the informative and the formative, and the different understandings of the human person that are at work behind them, I hope you caught that phrase. One has really no care about what kind of person you produce. They just need to be smart, get the reputation of the school up there. But the other one believes that the educational process is about the production of the person at the end. It's about the shaping of the person in the process. And the different understandings of the human person that are at work behind them, I suggest that over the past decades, institutions of Christian education have unwittingly absorbed the former, that's the informative, and eschewed or scooted away the latter. In other words, we can say that we're a Christian school all we want, but as long as we're mainly on the informative dynamic, focusing only on Christian worldview, we're really just hiding behind a moniker. We're not achieving what we say we are. Many Christian colleges, schools, and universities, particularly of the Protestant tradition, have taken on board a picture of the human person that owes more to modernity and the enlightenment than it does the holistic biblical vision of human persons. He's calling out the, the schools that take the name Christian or have a Christian organization behind them. And he's saying, really, it's the secular awakening of three centuries ago that's really guiding you, not the holistic biblical worldview. Something to think about. This is modern. It reduces the Christian faith primarily to a set of ideas, principles, claims, and propositions that are known and believed. And the goal of all this is correct thinking. Well, there's nothing wrong with correct thinking. But the truth of the matter is, there's training. There's a development of spiritual and moral sensitivities. This is what we believe in our educational system. But this makes it sound as we are essentially the... This makes it sound as if we are essentially the sort of things that Descartes described us to be. Thinking things that are containers for ideas. What if this is actually only a small slice of who we are and what if it's not even the most important one? Now, I don't want anybody to get lost in what I'm doing here, so I'm going to summarize what he's saying. He's saying, what if like those enlightenment thinkers, we think the main goal of education is just put ideas into people? What if the body is really just kind of something that we have? And I'm going to show you a slide right after this one that says, if you go along with the Greek view of things, the dualistic view where the body's bad and the spirit's good, well, the body's almost an inconvenience. So just fill it up with ideas. But what he's saying, what if filling it with ideas is really the smaller piece of the puzzle? What if it's the actual formation of a person? What if it's the actual preparation of a character? What if it's an actual concept of life service with eternity in mind? What if filling a mind with ideas is the smaller part of the piece of the puzzle? In the rationalist picture, we're not only reduced to primarily thinking things, we're also seen as things whose bodies are non-essential and rather regrettable containers for our mind. Let's go a little farther. This is why such constructions of a Christian worldview are also dualistic. They tend to assume a distinction between our souls and our bodies. And they tend to ignore our embodiment or even wish it wasn't there. In other words, let's get rid of this body. Let's move on. But what if our bodies are essential to our identities? What, maybe we weren't created as embodied creatures. What if the core of identity is located more in the body than in mind? Now, I'm not here to say that last question is exactly right. But I'm gonna show you now as we open our Bibles that we've drifted into the wrong way of doing school. And we're not producing people that wanna serve in our churches. We're not producing people that are terribly better, much better than some of those billboards on the sides of those buildings in Las Vegas. And we need to do different. Take your Bibles and open them up to the book of Genesis. First book, chapter 2. Genesis chapter 2. I want you to see some things maybe you haven't seen. I want you to embrace a new commitment to symmetry of character. We as Adventists, if we're going to have an army of youth rightly trained, are going to have to have an army of administrators rightly trained and an army of parents rightly trained and a church family rightly trained. By the way, tomorrow we're not just having fun building birdhouses. We're going to cut out a thousand birdhouses and we're going to disseminate them at the upcoming North American Division Educational Convention. And right on the front of the birdhouse will be a quote that says, in itself, the beauty of nature has the power to soften and subdue these are the kind of messages we've got to get back out because we're so set 
on making sure we follow the curriculum and jam as much in as we can that we're missing out and we have aberrations of individuals that don't really reflect the spirit, the servant heart of Christ or the pioneers of this church. Genesis chapter 2, looking at what God did in the beginning. We'll start at verse 7. The Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground, and he breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living being. Now, I don't want us to miss the fact that all the rest of the creation was spoken into existence, but not you and not me. And if you think it's not, if you think it's only Adam and Eve, just read Psalm 139 again. The Bible says we were knit together by our Savior in our mother's wombs. I don't know the mechanics of it, but I know this. It's not just laws set in motions. There's something about our dear Savior who has an extreme interest in the physicality of who we are. We were made in his image with a body. It wasn't bad. It is to be exercised. It is to keep balanced the way the mind works. Our minds are not to be running so hot that we need a cooling pad to slow them down. But when they start doing it, there is one. It's called physical labor. It's called the out of doors. It's called manual instruction. Verse 8. The Lord God planted a garden toward the east in Eden, and there he placed a man whom he had formed. And out of the ground the Lord caused to grow every tree that's pleasing to the sight and good for food. We'll skip down, if we could do that, to verse 15. The Lord God took the man, and he put him into a garden, the Garden of Eden, to cultivate it and to keep it. Now, I want you to understand something. Created completely without imbalance, completely perfect. God takes the first two people, and I can imagine those morning and evening walks were amazing moments of learning. And he says, I'm going to show you how you're going to fill a large part of your day. Before there's any sin, before there's any sense that anything's out of whack or any out of balance, you're going to have the morning and the evening with me, and you're going to have the middle of the day in this garden. Now, if in a perfect place, God chooses the out of doors and in a, a, a situation of agronomy or agriculture, what's to make us think that somehow we're so advanced and so much more uh, built up in our moral capacities that we wouldn't still need that kind of balancing to make sure that the symmetrical character is being formed? God God created us by using his hands and then he said, here's something for your hands to do and in the doing of it, there was a blessing. Our kids need to be a whole lot more outside and a whole lot less engaged in what's going on on the insides of these little computer devices they've got. Take these away from your kids. There's a whole genre of, com of vacation options that are digital free. Why are we following the world into the simple entertainment mode of our children's minds? Now, I'm going to skip over some of what's in the scriptures. Let's go, if we could, to the book of 2 Kings chapter 6. 2 Kings chapter 6. And I want to look at a story that shows very clearly that what Ellen White talks about was being encountered in the experience of the Hebrews. 2 Kings chapter 6. It's the story of Elisha. They've grown. Their school is going in the right direction. And by the way, friends, I want to say something. I, I, I am exceptionally loyal to our church and our schools. And I'm thankful for what they've done for my family. But I do want to say something to you. Something's wrong in our homes. Something's wrong in our churches. And something is wrong in our schools. Because we're supposed to be the head and not the tail. Nobody's supposed to be able to stand against us. We're supposed to be prospering in everything we do, but we're not. Now, there is a certain measure of prosperity in this village community here, this church and school. And I see it in the homes. And I want to see it continue to progress. But if you want to believe the Lord your God, you can be established. If you want to believe his prophets, you can prosper. I believe that we're going to have to work on the basis of inspiration with certain academic rigor and relational commitments so that we can move us back the way we need to go. This school in Elisha's day is growing. They need more room. The suggestion is that they go take care of it themselves. It's not that they get a budget committee together to see how much adding on to their school would cost. It's that they will be the masters of circumstance, not the victims. Sounds like something out of the book Education, I believe. And in 2 Kings chapter 6, we have the story of Elisha being summoned by his pupils saying, you know what? It's just a little bit too crowded here. And we have an idea. Don't you just love it? 
Verse 1, and the sons of the prophets said to Elisha, Behold now, the place before you where we're living is too limited for us. Let us go to the Jordan and each of us take from us a beam. Let's make a place there for ourselves that we may, where we may live. And he said, go. And then one of them said, we wish you'd come too. And he said, I will. You ever read the book Education? She talks about how powerful it is for our teachers to have engagements with our kids outside of the classroom. You can think church. You can think some other ministry, some other way. But I'm here to tell you, friends, the key to our motivation in learning is the desire of the children to please the teacher. It is the families and the communities they create. Now, obviously, the teacher can't make up for all the, the diminished dynamics of unhealthy homes, etc., which is why the home, the church, and the school work together. But when Elisha shows up on the River Jordan, he's got himself a tool and he knows how to use it. And every one of our young people should know how to do a variety of things. It may be changing a tire or changing the oil. It may be having an intelligent understanding of how electrical circuits work, or how you put one block on top of another, and what mortar is, and grout is, and bond beam. It may be that they need to understand what a truss, or a stringer, or something else like that is, and it may be that they need to know what a, what a trap is in a line that drains a sink. But whatever it is, our young people need to be the most well-rounded, best informed for living life, not just getting a career. And while they're down there chopping down their trees, an ax head goes into the river and a miracle is performed, a miracle that is a result of the well-roundedness of what's going on in the experience of Israel. In Ecclesiastes 9.10, it says, whatever your hands find to do, do it with all your might, for there's no work or device or knowledge or wisdom in the grave where you're going. And let's talk just for a minute about Nehemiah. You know, Nehemiah is discouraged. There's no wall around Jerusalem. His people are living open to the vagaries and the attacks of the surrounding nations. The king says, what's wrong, Nehemiah? And he tells a story. He ends up going with provision from the king. That night, he takes two or three people. He goes around the city. He looks it all over. Now, I'm here to tell you something. We have no knowledge that the cupbearer had any training in being a contractor, a builder, or anything else except for what we've learned from the spirit of prophecy and the emphasis on the whole person in the Bible. But there's no way that Nehemiah could go around that city that night, come back and have a plan without having learned a few things about how to work with his hands. He tells what God's done for them. He says to the people, Let's go ahead and do this. And they say, let us rise up and build. Well, was there just a whole group of stonemasons sitting around in Jerusalem? No, but there were a lot of people that knew how to use their hands and they'd be a quick study because they had been taught some practical trade. And in 52 days, because they're completely committed, blessed by God, have good leadership, and also have some good training, they put a wall up around the city and make everybody else just a tad bit nervous that this nation of Israel just might be reestablished. Paul tells us that he worked with his hands. He also says, whatever you do, do it heartily as unto the Lord and not unto men. He also told us, as the communities of faith were somewhat persecuted and prone to get just a little bit dependent on the institution and the superstructure, if you don't work, you don't eat. There's simple things like this that were so woven into the fabric of who they were that it would be hard to imagine the Jewish nation as anything but formative. They were formative in the shaping, not just informative. An informative education is an incomplete education. I go so far to say that an education that is only informative is a potentially immoral education, especially when you know what we know, which is why we're not to be taking our kids to amusement parks. We're supposed to be taking them out into the garden. We're supposed to be taking them out into the wilds and the wilderness and the wide open places. We're supposed to be teaching them to stop and think and meditate and reflect instead of filling every thinking moment with something that's responding to them, studying them and stalking them. We need to think about this. Now, I need a little illustration. I've invited one of our young men to come up here and help me. David, if you'd come on up, please. This is David. David is a friend of mine. Just position yourself between those white buckets, if you would. David, you're a young man who has a lot of enthusiasm. And uh, I'm trusting that at home, Mama and Papa are putting you to good work, all right? And I'm trusting you're doing whatever you can with all your heart, mind, and soul. Now, David, 
if one of our contractors were here today and they said, I've got a job for you. I want you to carry these two buckets from here to the back of the church. Well, you're an enthusiastic person. You could grab onto that real quickly. So go ahead, David. Don't leave the stage. Just pick those two buckets up, would you? Something wrong? This one's a bit heavier. A bit heavier? Yep. How, much, how much heavier do you think it is, David? A couple 20 pounds. Maybe 30. There's just a bunch of steel in that bucket, David. Now, if, if I asked you to do that all day long, five days a week, and that one bucket was as heavy as it is and this buck was, bucket was so much lighter, well, how do you think your physical shape would be after 40 hours of carrying that bucket around like that? One half would be big, the other one would be big. All right, I wonder if you might walk like this. <laughs> is that possible? Why don't you uh, let me help you rearrange this just a little bit. Let's just pull this out and let's make it to where it's something we call balanced. Eh, go ahead and lift those up. Let's see how we're doing now. Is that a little better? Yep. Not quite good enough. Let's trade one more. Go ahead and set them down. All right. You know, David, we're all hoping. Go ahead and pick them up again. We're all hoping, David, you get a wonderfully balanced education too. All right. Is that better? Yep. You're not wanting to lean this way? Nope. All right. Thank you. You can set those down. Go have a seat. Now, I have hopes that this young man will grow up to be a wonderfully symmetrical person, that he'll know how to fix things. His wife will like that someday. And that he'll be able to teach his kids a thing or two about more than just how to read and write. It's my hope that this young man will serve his church, volunteering, whether he gets a paycheck or not. It's my hope that this church will not be peripheral to him in his adulthood. It's my hope that he will care that a lost world hears about Jesus. It's my hope that this young man will have a successful relational life because he's well-balanced and symmetrical. And I happen to believe on the merits of faith that if this man is well-balanced, his mind will not go backwards while his body and his relationships and his moral development are going forward. Does anybody else happen to believe that? Let's think about this for a minute, friends. We're either going to live by faith and believe that we should be looking to weed some things out of our curriculum so we have the time for the balancing, or we're going to have to live by sight and be catching up and be the tail and not the head. It's always been my desire to be the head and not the tail. Now, I leave you with this. For 30 years, Jesus understood what a symmetrical education was like. It didn't rob him of mental acuity or ability. It didn't rob him of social ability. It didn't rob him of the ability to suffer the vicissitudes and the difficulties of a ministry for three and a half years that was very, very demanding. And by the way, friends, I don't know any young person who has a symmetrical development that is easily discouraged, easily depressed, thinking about taking their own life. The Bible says we should have a spirit, not of fear, but of power, of love, and of a sound mind. And I just so happen to believe that when somebody thinks they're a victim and they don't know how to change their circumstances, they tend to feel victimized. But there's nothing worse than being a victim. And since the book Education says we should make these young men and these young women masters of circumstance, not victims of circumstance, I'm just sort of thinking that with the darkness that's coming down on the world, we might need a new light to start shining in the precincts of our home, our churches, and our schools. The truth of the matter is we have a mental health crisis going on, not just amongst the general society, but in our young people. But I want to tell you, somebody who's excited about the opportunities and the expanding vistas of what they can do because somebody taught them how to use their hands and stick with a job and care about people. This is an amazing formula for formative, not just informative education. And it's time as a people that we come back to believing what Jesus experienced 30 years in a home, working in a carpenter shop, doing what his father asked him to do very well, and then serving with all of his heart, not for a big paycheck, but for love. That's part of a formative education. We know the higher motivations are the intrinsic motivations that help us achieve great causes even if the world doesn't recognize them as great. This is what I hope and pray for my own children. As they were growing up, I was praying, Lord, make them soldiers in the army of Christ. And by the way, Jesus put us in these bodies. And I want to tell you, they're not going to be totally left behind. The fact of the matter is, when Jesus was resurrected, he could pass through walls, but he still ate food. And when his doubting Thomas friend said, 
not going to believe unless I see, unless I touch you. He said, touch me. Spirit, spirit doesn't have flesh and blood. So whatever we're getting when we go to heaven isn't going to be like the, the aberration that most of the Christian world has of us floating around on clouds, wearing clothes that are too skimpy with bows and arrows and shooting at people's hearts, etc. No, that's not the view of heaven. We're going to build houses and inhabit them. You see, in the beginning, it's a holistic, formative education, not just in formative. And in the end, which goes on forever, it's going to be a formative continuing education, not just informative. So in the meantime, are we balanced? Are we able to show the way in this morass of the implosion of values in our society? Are we preparing young people that will stand out head and shoulders above, who are noble and hardworking and loving? And yes, they're going to be smart too, because we're not going to skip on the dynamics and God's going to bless the movements of faith. Friends, Jesus is coming back. He's not going to be a spirit or an apparition. He's going to be real. We're going to walk on real streets of gold. We're going to build houses in the country, enjoy living in the home of God himself. And in the meantime, there's a few lessons we're going to have to come back to. And that is that balance matters. At the cross, Jesus brought together love and truth, mercy and justice, law and grace. When you live a life that's imbalanced, you're going to be an aberration on the gospel. And so will our products. This morning, friends, I'm appealing to you. Let's go back to the prophet. Let's believe the God of heaven and be established in his prophets and prosper. We're under start undertaking an important journey here at the Village Church. We're seeking to establish a form of education that brings the symmetry back in, that brings the beauty and trust and faith that our kids won't go backwards. We can measure them to death in these days. There's all kinds of assessments. But what about the beauty of Christ? What about the formation of Christ within the hope of glory? This morning, friends, I'm inviting you to come back to a posture of faith that doesn't deny the data and the studies and the learning, but says, above all else, we will lift up Jesus. We will trust in the light that shines from the cross. We will bring the symmetry of mind, body, and soul back together into a formative experience so that when God appears, he can say, well done, good and faithful servant. We need an army of Christian young people. And if we're going to do it, it's going to have to be beautiful symmetry, complete balance, walking by faith. I've chosen for our closing song this afternoon, Faith is the Victory, because there's going to be a lot of things that press against this. We're going to have to get away from the affirmation of the outside world we're going to have to take a few risks and do things a little bit differently. But if we trust the Lord, he's never let us down in the past and he's not going to start now. Let's stand together as we sing.